Chris Rosie, I'm the CEO of Strider, uh, where you've all found your online booking resources for everything equestrian throughout the world. Um, welcome tonight to our professional development webinar. Uh, we have these webinars throughout the year, usually about once a month with leading experts in the industry um, by popular request. Uh, we've been having them uh throughout different topics and different subjects because of people like you who've been asking for more information and more skills and more opportunities to grow your businesses so tonight we're going to be having a, a discussion on how to boost your clinic revenue um, we've got two experts that many of you know uh, helena harris of stall and stable and margaret McKelvey of mythic landings enterprises here tonight to talk about some of their perspective um, frequently, when you think about revenue, you think about financial revenue. Um, I think you're going to hear, as these two women talk tonight, you're going to hear a little bit about emotional revenue as well. Um, that's one trend that we've been hearing from many of you over the last year, that as you try to bring in additional money through the uh, clinic series that you're hosting, that sometimes emotionally you're not bringing in as much emotional energy um, into your business or that you feel drained because of how it's being organized or because of how people are approaching you so the tools and the skills and the knowledge that they're going to be talking about tonight are really going to help you with both of those things and figure out all right how do you set up a clinic series can you make another ten fifteen thousand dollars a year through a clinic series and what's the best way to do that uh, in today's industry without the sport so coming up first, we're going to have Margaret, uh, who has a very diverse background. Um, she has uh, her business, Mythic Landings Enterprises, which supports everything from some of the leading organizations and associations in the sport to some of the top riders and Olympic athletes in the sport. She's got a wealth of knowledge of how to organize clinic for top trainers and top athletes. She works with smaller barns. She works with larger barns. Uh, she also competes in eventing, so you might see her out and about, especially in Area 2 with her lovely gelding. Um, she's also a published author and has a book coming out later this year, um, which she'll tell you a little bit more about. Um, so if you're looking at Horse and Rider, you're going to get on the wait list. Uh, it's coming out, I believe, in June, um, so make sure you keep an eye out for that. Um, she'll be kicking off tonight's discussion first. Helena will then go after her and I'll give you some more information about Helena when she comes up. Um, she is with Stall and Stable. She's a business consultant that knows a tremendous amount of how to set up your business and how to do it efficiently and make sure that you're actually got a business model that's going to work for your specific farm or your venue. Uh, great information um, from both of them to share this evening. Uh, as you have questions, make sure to chat your questions to Natasha Springers Levine uh, using the chat function in Zoom. Uh, she is our Chief Operating Officer at Strider. She'll be coordinating the questions and answer sessions. So both of um, Helena and Margaret will do their presentations. Then we're going to have some um, panel discussion and then um, open it up for Q&A. So please, as you have your questions, feel free to chat them on over so you don't lose them in your head. Um, both of these women have great answers and great um, flexibility in answering stuff. So no question too small, make sure you get them in the chat function. Um, and with that, uh, I will turn it over to Margaret uh, to kick off this evening. Hey everyone, I am Margaret with Mythic Landing, and as Tara um, told you, I do a lot of clinic organizing. Um, just this winter, I had, I think I'm on 22 of 24 clinics that I have um, scheduled, which is a lot. And so what I'm going to show you is kind of how I do this in a way that um, is pretty efficient because, you know, essentially time is money. And also you don't want to just drive yourself insane organizing these clinics because then that kind of takes all the enjoyment out of it. And I know I started organizing clinics. Um, my first one was with Stephen Bradley. And the reason why I did it was because I myself wanted to take a lesson with Stephen and I was like, well, maybe if I, you know, get a group of people together and do a clinic, he can come out to me. Um, and that is how I got started. Um, and so, like I said, I'm going to take you guys through just clinic organizing 101. 
Uh, don't worry about taking notes or anything because you will all be getting um, some templates and a handout that'll get emailed to you guys, I think afterwards, um, which has all of this information for you. Um, so the first thing to talk about is basically your information gathering. And this is where Strider really comes in handy. And I'm not just saying that because they are putting on this webinar, but I definitely was one of the first people to jump on board with Strider um, because I was like, oh my gosh, I don't have to have papers, you know, coming. I mean, people were filling out paper applications to come to clinics um, when I first started. And this just streamlined the whole process. Um, so, you know, the core things that you're looking to do are obviously get your rider's name and contact info. You want their experience level as well, because when someone signs up for a clinic, they're gonna sign up for the level that they want to participate in. But when I do clinics, I let basically the first 20 people sign up regardless of level. And so that may mean that I end up with half of those riders being at the beginner novice, you know, two, six level. And so to divide those people up into groups, I look at the experience level to kind of curate groups that seem to make more sense. Um, so that is important information for you. Then I always keep track of what the person owes. So when they sign up, whatever that amount is, and that can vary depending on if you're doing a multi-day clinic and they've signed up for one of the three days, um, if there's any extra fees attached with a facility in terms of a trailer in fee or stabling fee or whatever. So I just quickly add up what they owe, track that along with how they paid and when they paid. And that just helps when I'm doing my bookkeeping and my bank reconciliations I have an idea of where the money is and where it came from um, because I do a lot of clinic series, um, whether it's, you know, I just finished up a winter clinic series and I'll have people sign up, you know, a month or two in advance and pay in advance. And so it's nice to kind of know, all right, that person paid back in January. And again, when I'm doing my bookkeeping and stuff. Um, the next things that you want to make sure that you have ready for people are their waivers, whatever waivers are attached with the facility or the clinician. There's a lot of easy ways um, to have digital waivers now, and I think Strider offers um, digital waivers through the platform as well. I definitely recommend doing that. Again, it just cuts down on paper. Um, one thing that I always get, and I usually add this as like the last line on my waivers, is emergency contact information. That way, the day of the clinic should, for whatever reason, you need to contact someone's emergency contact. I have that information readily available and I'm not, you know, scrambling to find that. Um, then of course you need your Coggins. Sometimes some places request vaccination records. Um, and then the last thing is whenever I do a lot of weekday clinics where school and work come into play. So I tell people that if they have a time constraint to let me know when they sign up. If you don't let me know when you sign up, there's no guarantees that it's going to happen. But if someone, when they sign up says, hey, you know, my kid doesn't get out of school until whatever time, we can't go until then, I'll tell them then, okay, that's a possibility or not. Um, if you're doing your, like your clinic signups through Strider, all of this information is captured right there. And you do have the ability to um, download a spreadsheet as well if you need that available to you. 
Like I said, I do a lot of clinic series. Um, and so I've started using Google Sheets um, and I'll have a template for you guys that's available to you. Um, and the great thing about doing that is, again, I'm doing a lot of the organizing. And so there's usually a clinician involved and then a host facility involved. And I can give all of the people that are involved in whatever particular clinic access to that Google Sheet, and then it's a free app on your phone. And so you can just access that information while, um, you know, basically at any time, which is really helpful. So that is your information gathering. And like I said, just streamline this, get your spreadsheet going. If you're only doing one clinic, like a one-off type clinic, I also recommend just telling people that they have to sign up through Strider, again, because the goal is that you want all of your information in one place. You don't want to have to scramble and having papers and registrations coming in from all different directions, because that's just going to take a lot of time. Um, and so you're trying to cut down on the amount of time that you're chasing, you know, paperwork, essentially. Um, then you want to go ahead and think about your clinic policies, all right? And so this is where you kind of get into the business side of things, where you don't want to be the person that is always saying yes, because if you're always saying yes, you're going to drive yourself insane. Um, and so what I do is I just set up very clear clinic policies. I make them readily available. And they help not only myself, um, but also the people that are signing up. They kind of know the rules and they're right there for them. Um, and, you know, they're good to go. So some things to think about with your clinic policies are your open date and your close date. If you're someone who doesn't want people signing up too far in advance, then set your open date to be six to eight weeks prior. For the close date, what I have found and what's my policy at Mythic Landing is the closing date is six days prior to the clinic. And the reason why it is six days prior to the clinic is because on day five is when I send out the first tentative schedule. And so I've just done a lot of, I say market research, but you know, I basically just asked a lot of people, both riders and clinicians and farm owners, and that six days prior seemed to work for people in my area. Um, and then you have to decide, do you want to accept late entries? If so, when is your final, final cutoff? And if you are accepting late entries, is there gonna be a late entry fee attached to it? Um, for myself in the clinics that I do, I do allow late entries, which essentially are on that day five and four before a clinic. So if you sign up on day four or five before a clinic, if I have room and if it fits into the schedule, um, I will accept your entry and there is a late entry fee attached to that. Um, and then just think about some other stuff in terms of other fees that you might not have thought about. Do you want to offer discounts like a pony club discount, or maybe you have an adult riders group in your area? Um, do you want to allow changes? Do you want to have a refund policy? Are you going to have a fee that is attached with making changes or refunds? Again, these are all things that, I mean, my policies are, like I said, a late fee closing date is four days prior because I send out my final, final schedule on three days prior. Um, and if you want to make a change, you can do that um, up until the closing date without a fee attached to it. Um, if you have to cancel for some reason and you can do that before the close date. Again, I usually will allow that to happen um, without a fee attached. Um, and then just think about your payment options. Do you want to accept only credit cards? Do you want to accept checks? Do you want to accept, you know, just how do you want the money to come to you? 
Um, and so again, just all things to think about. And again, on Strider, it kind of walks you through all of this, which is nice because it's a lot of things that you might not have thought of if you're a first time clinic organizer. Then you have to think about your rider communication, like when and how. I do everything on email. Um, you know, you're going to get your registration confirmation. So there's four times that I'm talking to people when they register. Again, if you do it through Strider, that confirmation is automated. Um, and then I send out my tentative schedule five days prior, my final schedule three days prior. And then if I have any sponsors involved in the activity, I will sometimes do a follow up after the clinic to remind everybody of the sponsors that were involved in the activity. Um, again, in that handout that you guys will all be getting, I have email templates like that I've just made over the years. Um, and so I have those for you guys and you can just copy and paste if that works for you. Um, and then the last thing, I'm not sure, I think Helena, you're gonna talk about this as well, um, but this is just a question that I get a lot is how to make the schedule. And I wish there was a magic formula. This is the one thing that I really do still do with pen and paper um, is mapping out my day. Um, but basically this is kind of my ideal day, you know, dressage or usually always private lessons. Um, an ideal show jumping day is five groups of four riders and an ideal cross country day is four groups of five riders. Um, but again, you can, you know, adjust that as needed. Um, but again, this is just kind of the timeframes that tend to work for me. Um, so I know I talked really fast, but I wanted to make sure that I got through everything so that everyone had time to ask any questions. Um, and then we can move on to Helena's portion about all the money and nuts and bolts of making sure that, you know, you're making money and um, certainly not losing money. Um, so that is everything that I had for you guys. Um, and again, always here to answer any questions. Margaret, before we move on, since that content's still very fresh in everyone's minds, can you talk a little bit about the one or two areas where you tend to find um, a little bit more friction than others as a either, if you were to say to a first time clinic organizer, what are the one or two areas they wanna spend a little bit more time on, whether that's communications to the riders or setting their policies, what have you found? <laughs> definitely would sit down and create your policies. Like I said, my policies surround this schedule because like I said, I did, I'm doing 24 schedules this winter. And so in order to not completely lose my mind this winter, I had to have the process very automated. And so that's where I came up with the closing date being six days prior. And then you just have to stick to it because inevitably you're going to have people that email or text you or whatever and say, oh, but please, you know, or but this happened. And, you know, it's kind of like rules are rules. Um, I think the good analogy is to think of your clinic space as a ticket to a concert or to a play, you know. Um, and I also tell people to treat it like a horse show. You know, it's kind of known that if you can't make it to a horse show for whatever reason, you're not getting your money back. Um, and a clinic is the same thing. You know, you've booked an instructor, a clinician for a certain amount of time. And, you know, certainly if they're not teaching the clinic, they could be teaching at home or doing something. So you basically booked it out. Um, and so I just think that if you sit down and you write down your policies, that's why I said those are as much for me as they are for the riders, you know, because they just help guide me because I'm definitely a sucker. And I definitely always want to be that yes person. Um, but if you say yes to everybody, 
it's it's just going to get out of control. That's very, very well said. Do you also have a particular time budget that you say, hey, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. This is sort of the bookends of the amount of time I'm going to budget to organize a clinic. Uh, one of the things that folks definitely come back to us with is, hey, listen, I organized this clinic and I organized it and I made $300, but my mental stress from the paperwork was insane. Um, and so, you know, as you start getting through some of those best practices, where do you say, okay, once you get the rhythm going and you get the practices established and the communications established, how much time do you budget or is there um i think that's hard to say because you're gonna spend a bit of time at the beginning like setting up your spreadsheets and i know that spreadsheets are not everybody's favorite thing but they will pay off in the end i promise um even something as silly as when you download your um clinic registrations or like I do, I use a clinic um, or I use Google Sheets. When I go to make my schedule, I do a sort by level. And then I just have, all right, here's my block of beginner novice riders. Here's my block of novice riders. Um, so thinking ahead and spending a little bit time, you know, when you, I have a list of things that I do when I have a, a clinic date, I know that I need to do X, Y, and Z, you know, from putting it on Strider, putting it on websites, putting it on social media, and then creating my Google sheet. Um, because again, I do a lot of series, you know, where people are coming places on a monthly basis. Um, and that, that really helps me. Um, so we're going to transition in just a moment to Helena, but I, we had one question come in from the audience, which probably should be asked now and not at the end. Um, you just mentioned a little bit of your marketing. Uh, top three ways you like to market to boost the revenue of your clinic series. Is that social media? Is that email? How do you, how do you tend sure. to work? So basically, like I, I referenced that list of things that I do with every clinic. So basically step one, I set up the registration on Strider. Then I put it on whatever websites make sense, whether that's the rider's website, the host farm's website, I make sure that it's there because I want it to be easy for people to find the sign up link. Um, then I go ahead and I go to social media with Facebook and Instagram, and we use Twitter and, and stuff like that, making sure, again, that that date is going to pop up on people's calendars. So on Facebook, I do make events because we all get them where there, you get this little notification like, hey, whatever activity is going on near you, you know, you want your activity to be that activity. Um, and then the last thing is, if you have access to an email list, I always save emails from people that email me about clinics um, or have signed up for clinics. Send that email out to say, hey, heads up, so-and-so is coming on this date. Here's the link of how to sign up. Um, so that's kind of my automated uh, marketing strategy that I check things off um, once I book a date. Fantastic. I know a lot of folks are looking looking over to Mythic Landings for, okay, we know Mythic Landings has this figured out, so what can we, what can we pull for and what can we copy, um, especially when it comes to the social media. So thank you so much for sharing. Some yeah. And I've been doing this for 10 years, which makes me feel very old, but you know, <laughs> um, this isn't stuff that I figured out overnight, you, you know, but it's stuff that I'm happy to share. And I'm sure next year I'll have something that I do a little bit differently. But this is what's worked and kind of gotten me to this point of the winter still smiling. <laughs> good, good. Smiling is an important thing to have. Um, so with that, um, as you all, some of, we've got more and more people popping on um, as the evening goes in. So as you have questions, again, uh, make sure you chat them over to Natasha Springers Levine. We're going to be doing a Q&A session in detail at the end of this. So if there's anything that Margaret didn't have a chance to dive into, but you want to ask her, make sure you pop that into the chat and we'll have a chance to ask her at the end. Um, we're going to transition over to Helena Harris, who's got, um, you know, Margaret just said 10 years, but Helena's got 25 years of experience in the horse world. 
Um, so, you know, she's got eight years of Bit of Britain. She's had 10 years of um, Horse Radio Network. She's been doing marketing services for countless horse businesses throughout the U.S. She also runs a consultancy um, which helps equine businesses really figure out what their business model is and how to generate a profit from their various um, various activities and she's got a fantastic quote that she says better than i do but you know what areas of your facility are do you have untapped revenue untapped potential from um so we're going to transition over to her presentation um which gives us a little bit of the business model aspect of it a little bit of the how do you figure out whether or not you're actually going to make any money on this particular clinic i'm sure you've got your administrative organization you know that you've got all these riders showing up you know what they're um, areas are, you know who to call if somebody, God forbid, falls off and you've got all their waivers signed, but are you going to make any money at it? Or are you just going to have a lot of clinics showing up um, at your facility and you're not going to be able to buy that new saddle that you've been saving up for? So with that, um, Helena, thank you so much for joining us. I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much. And hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be back here doing another webinar for Strider. I just, I love doing these. I really, I don't, realize it until I look at the playback later. And I'm like, wow, I had a lot of fun doing that. <laughs> um, the reason I like doing this is because there's a lot of stress when it comes to running a horse business. Tons. Uh, it, burnout happens in the blink of an eye. And so if I can offer one or two pieces of advice that can save your soul as you're trying to live your dream, right? Um, then that that's gratifying for me. That's my purpose. And, you know, like Margaret, I started doing clinics because I didn't have a lot of top tier talent in my area and I wanted it. Um, and through the process of attending clinics, booking them, uh, I learned a ton and of course figured out how to take some basic best practices in business and business modeling and apply it to the clinic process. And I'm going to share my, um, my slides in just a second here, but I wanted to say, Margaret, you know, I, I love how organized you are. And I think that that goes a long way in creating value for clinic attendees and for the clinicians. And so um, when you're thinking about planning a clinic for your farm, being organized is, should be at the top of your list. How easy is it for you to pull this off, right? It's, it's, you don't wanna add more stress. So using um, outside resources like Strider can streamline the process getting yourself organized all creates a far less stressful experience for you and your, your customers, right? The other riders. Um, so let's go to my, I'm going to pull up my presentation and then share my screen. Here we are. And we're going to do not that I'm going to make you a little sick for a second, make you a little dizzy. Okay. So I come at the, I back into this, the whole clinic model. I look at it as how can I make money at this? It's great. We all want to ride with great clinicians, but I'm running a business and I need to make sure that if I'm bringing in someone to teach that I'm not going to lose money on it. So let's, let's start there. What do I need to understand so that I break even? So it's not costing me money to, to put this on. So the first thing I do is take a look at my expenses. And like Margaret, I believe in spreadsheets. Google Sheets are free, Microsoft Excel, whatever you have, um, Apple numbers. You can set up a very basic spreadsheet to calculate your costs. That's the first thing you're going to do. And list every expense that you can think of. And this is where a lot of business owners kind of fall down a bit. They don't think about every little detail that's going to cost them money. So some of the more common expenses would be obviously your clinician fee. And those vary. Some clinicians charge by the rider, some charge a flat fee per day, some charge a flat fee per experience. Lodging, where is your clinician gonna stay? Are they coming from out of town? Or do they have to fly? Um, if they fly in, what are schedules like? Do they need to rent a car? That can rack up some serious fees. Food. Even if you feed the clinician, you still have to shop, right? You got to go to the grocery store and you, you got to buy food. Um, are you going to feed your attendees or not? Are they responsible for feeding themselves? 
extra staffing. Maybe you want to pay, maybe you've got a working student and you want to throw them a little extra cash to help with parking or to serve as jump crew. And then technology. Do you have fees? Let's say, you know, a lot of people these days are using PayPal and Venmo to collect their clinic fees. And I think that's not a great idea. It might seem easy, but you have none of the guarantees and none of the protection and none of the efficiency that you have in a platform like Strider. Everything is built in there. So, um, and what's nice is it doesn't cost you anything, but you, you're not going to get a real handle on how profitable a clinic can be until you understand exactly how much it's going to cost. And you do need a spreadsheet to manage that. The other thing you want to think about is what format is your clinic? Are you going to do group sessions, privates? Are you going to be primarily demonstration based? Um, and, you know, that's kind of a format that I think can make, um, has good profit margins. It doesn't cost you a lot of money to bring a clinician in to do demonstrations, um, but you can get a lot of auditors. So decide what kind of format you want, who the clinician is. Are you doing, um, are you doing a dressage clinic? Are you doing a jumping clinic? Are you doing groundwork, clicker training? Helena, I'm going to hop in for just a moment um, because you have a fantastic photo that people aren't getting an opportunity to see. So there's a little technical glitch in your sharing of slides. If you have a chance, see if you can get it to go full screen and advance it. You had it full screen earlier. I don't know if you, how you did that. Any better? Um, we're seeing the correct slide now. Um, you were full screen before. I don't know if you can do full screen still, but that's fine. It's as long as we can see. Online. Let's try this again. That's okay, as long as we're on the right slide. Is this any better? Um, it's better, it's on the right slide now. So you had that fantastic picture of Barbie um, in the Barbie. slide. And so, you know, don't be like Barbie, right? Don't be like Barbie. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this was when I had a sense of humor back before I started doing clinics. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the So decide on what format you want your clinic to be. And why is format important? Well, that's because the, um, it's the value in what you're providing. And that's actually one, one slide ahead, but quality or quantity. So backing up um, before we get onto value, you, you understand what kind of format you want. Is it uh, jumping? Is it dressage? Is it groundwork? Do you want to pack as many people into a day as possible? Or do you want to provide a more customized, tailored experience so that whoever does shell out the cash to come to this event gets the most for their money? So are you, are you Walmart or are you Bloomingdale's? Or maybe you're somewhere in between. And a lot of what you decide your clinic is going to be like depends on what your business brand is. So, and, and it doesn't mean that being um, having a Walmart brand is bad or less than it just means that um, you're more about quantity. You're more about educating as many people as you can. And whereas quality is you really want to provide a customized, tailored experience. That's what you do. I'm a fan of fewer people, higher quality and a customized experience, because at the price point that most clinics happen at, the it's really hard to walk away with solid, tangible skills that you didn't have before. Because sometimes we only get 25, 30 minutes of a clinician's undivided attention, maybe an hour, maybe getting your horse to the clinic was very stressful. Maybe he or she wasn't as well behaved or cooperative as you'd like. So your stress level and your horse's stress level goes up. And you don't get as much out of the experience as perhaps you'd hoped. So I like to keep the clinics small and a little less hectic. And so what that does is for, for me and for my clients is it creates value. What you charge depends on the value you offer. 
Again, fewer riders means more time with the clinician. More time with the clinician means greater value. Greater value translates into a higher price. The other thing I do is I have conversations with the clinician before I set anything up. I like to find out what the clinician likes, what they want, who they like to teach, what floats their boat. Because the more excited and enthusiastic they are in the clinic, the more value they're going to bring to the attendees. So, I, I mean, I've, some of my clinician clients have said, we just show up and they pack them in and I'm teaching six, seven, eight people in a group. And I'm trying, and they really are trying to give everyone a hundred percent of themselves. And you just can't when you have that many people. So I like to have that conversation. Some clinic, clinicians, they don't care. They're like, sure, the more the merrier, bring it on. And others say, geez, you know, that's, no one's really asked me that before. I, here's what I think I would like. And so when all is said and done, the folks who've spent a couple hundred dollars to be there get a really, really good experience that they walk away um, better riders or better horsemen than before they attended the clinic. In addition to you know, the experience in the saddle or as an auditor, what does the venue offer that creates value? Convenient bathrooms, whether that's you know, indoor plumbing or porta potties, just make sure they're clean. Please, please, please make sure they're clean and they're well stocked. I don't care if they're old and they've got rusty pipes, they just need to be clean. Easy in, easy out trailer parking, right? If you have, uh, if you've got a large barn and you have an installed customer base, you don't have to go out and market to outside customers for this clinic. But not, you know, maybe what you're offering isn't everyone's cup of tea in your barn and you need to market to folks outside of your barn or even outside of your local area. They're going to need to truck in. How easy is it for them to do that? Is it safe? Once they do come in and they're loading and unloading horses, who can sometimes be fractious, I know, hard to believe, but it happens, then you want to make sure that there's a safe place for them to load, unload, leave the horses tied to the trailer safely, providing a warm-up area. Again, some of these clinics start seven, eight o'clock in the morning. If it's, especially if you're in the Northeast or the Northern part of the United States, it can be chilly. Horses need some time to warm up, to get settled. Having a warm-up area is really valuable. On the flip side, if you're in a warmer climate or it's the summertime, does your venue provide shade? If people are there all day long, their horses are there all day long, you want to make sure that they're comfortable. Maybe you have a floating room, extra staff around, a working student, maybe um, a mom of one of your kids is looking for something to do or can help somebody who can hold the horse while an attendee runs to the bathroom or grab a martingale, right? Or, oh, this my girth doesn't fit. Can you go check my dressing room for a larger girth? Something, someone that floats around can lend a hand can be very, very valuable. At the very least, if they even help one person, you've left that person. That person then becomes a valuable marketing tool for you because they felt supported and they had a good experience. Food available on site or at least nearby. Ease of registration. This is a really big one. And again, where Strider comes into play. Uh, me coming from a tech background and e-commerce in particular and usability in e-commerce, any friction or bottlenecks to the registration process, they're just, they leave a bad taste in the customer's mouth. So make it really easy for them to find the information that they need. What time does the clinic start? How much is it? Where do I register? What documents do you need from me? Everything needs to be really clear and really easy. Again, Strider, right? Highly organized. I get so many emails after clinics that say, Lena, 
This was so well done. This was so organized. I didn't have a single question. I showed up and knew exactly where I needed to go, what I had to do. I had questions. There's always someone there to answer them. And this, the point I'm going to make goes back to um, what Margaret and Tara were talking about in terms of communicating and how much time it takes you to organize your clinics. How much time it takes can be a blurry line because you have to answer every text message and every email and you kind of have to do it right away. Because if someone sends you a question about what time they have to be there or um, whether or not their horse is appropriate for this clinic, you wanna be able to answer them because we're horse people, right? We might have 37 seconds to send an email and we might not have another 37 seconds for two more days. So it's your job to make sure that you can answer emails, text messages or phone calls pretty much anytime one comes in. Good footing. It doesn't have to be super fancy, but it does need to be well-groomed. So make sure that you plan the night before every day of the clinic that you your ring is dragged. Um, you know, there's <laughs> there are no sh sharp things sticking up out of the ground. Um, I laugh, but it's happened. And then for your auditors, you know, they're paying money too. Make sure that they have a comfortable place to watch everything that's going on. If you don't have chairs for them, make sure you let them know they need to bring chairs. You're gonna to have to tell them six, seven, eight, nine, 22 times to bring their own chairs and that's okay. Just, they want, they need to be comfortable. And the other thing for auditors that I think is really important and creates a lot of value in your clinics is the ability to see and hear the clinician clearly. So for the clinics that I host, I make sure that my clinician has a headset and we have a PA system. It, don't, it doesn't always work that great, um, but when it does work, it makes it so much easier to hear those little side conversations that the clinician has with the rider where like the, that's where the power is. That's where all the juice is, those little conversations between clinician and rider, like what's happening? And so you get to hear that as the auditor. Knowing your local market is important as well. Again, I, I referred to, if you have a, if you're the owner of a boarding barn and you've got 10, 12, 20 stalls, you might have 10, 12 or 20 people who are interested in attending this clinic. But then again, maybe not. So can you fill a clinic with your clients? Will the clinician that you're bringing in be, will they appeal to local riders? So I had a really hard time filling a positive reinforcement or a horsemanship clinic in my area. My area has, they're hunter jumper people. They're, they're like, what? What's, you know, what's natural horsemanship? What's a clicker? Um, so that's a little difficult. So sometimes your marketing isn't just about, hey, here's this clinic, it's happening on this day and this is how much it's gonna cost. Sometimes you have to say, this is why the content or the clinician is important. This is why they are valuable to you. Whether you ride dressage, whether you are a jumper, um, Western dressage, what's the new, the um, what's the new, oh, working equitation. That's starting to really get popular around here. Can you accommodate things like truck-ins? So know your local market before you set up the clinic. And when you set it up, what format might best appeal to your local market? Auditing is really valuable. <laughs> and as the clinic organizer, I found this out by accident. I, and also having an anxious mayor who wasn't always a great ride for these clinics, I had to do a lot of auditing and I found myself coming away with pages and pages of notes and inspiration without the stress of having to make sure my horse was sound, make sure my horse, lo horse loaded on the trailer, um, that I had all my tack, that she could stay on the trailer while I went and watched the rest of the clinic 
So all these little details, I just found that that was less stress, but I got as much information from auditing as I would perhaps from writing. So don't undervalue the opportunity to audit and to provide auditing experiences for your clinics. Um, and again, creating extra value with features like audio systems, nice seating, and then little things after the fact, like private Q&A sessions with the clinician and networking opportunities. One of the things I like to do with the clinics that I organize is kind of create these groups after the fact. Um, usually it's on social media, but everybody stays connected. We exchange um, you know, social networking, follow me on Instagram, here's my email. And then those relationships actually persist beyond the clinic and you find yourself making friends. And because you've attended this clinic, you have similar values. And it's always nice to find more people who think like you do. So we've hit your um, slide hiccup again. We're still, um, we're a little, little behind you on the slides. There you go, perfect. Cause I know you had that. I wanted to make sure they were able to see um, your spreadsheet and the value that your spreadsheet brings um, because it launches very well into a little bit what Margaret was talking about on the spreadsheets. So a uh, great way to talk about how much money you make from the auditors and from those additional stuff. So this goes back to when I said backing into a clinic, how you wanna set it up. You start with your expenses and you list them out and you get your total number. Then you can just start to play around with, well, if it's gonna cost me, for example, here, 4,000 and change to put this clinic on, how many riders will I need to sign up at what rate? Okay, well, if I think that clinics around here go for about $300 a person, how many riders would I need to break even? How many riders, how many auditors? What can I charge? And so you plug in these numbers and as you're changing them, let's say you wanna only do 10 riders, you'll see these numbers change and then your net income changes. And do you wanna do 12 auditors? Do you wanna do 20 auditors? Do you wanna do 100 auditors? And as you plug, plug these numbers in, you can see where you're gonna break even and then where you might make a profit. At the same time, you'll know how many hours are, there are in a day, um, how many people you can fit into each time slot, how many folks your farm can accommodate. Out of those 12 riders that we have here in this example, are six of them in-house and the other six are trucking in? Do you have enough space for them? How will you schedule a time? So this is, this is another thing and it's kind of customer service based, but if someone's coming from, if you know someone's coming from an hour away, are you gonna schedule them for the first clinic of the day, the first ride of the day? Or um, if someone, it, let's say it's a two session day. So it's flat work in the morning and it's jumping in the afternoon. Are you gonna do an 11 o'clock flat and then a 12 o'clock jumping session? How stressful, you know, how strenuous is the flat gonna be? <clears throat> so you kind of wanna think about, you can use this um, these spreadsheets to manage your time slots as well as your rates and your break-even numbers. So this is where spreadsheets can become your friend. But if this looks intimidating to you, even though it's all fancy and color coded, <laughs> um, you can just buy it for me because I have all the numbers plugged in. You don't have to do any math. You can just play with what's ever in the gray and white boxes. You can change those however you'd like, experiment, and you can see how the numbers in the colored boxes will change. So, and, and that will help you decide number of people, format, and whether or not you need to or want to make money at these. There were, there's like a hundred other things that I wanna talk about, but I don't have a hundred other slides. So what I will say is if you go to stallandstable.com, that's my website and click around, I have a lot of downloadable self-serve products that can help you plan this stuff. And then if you get stuck or any of it seems intimidating, 
you can just click the book an appointment button with me and I can walk you through it. Um, a lot of times people say, well, these are my, this is my specific circumstance. This is the clinician that I want to bring in. And this is what I have. I've got a 10 stall barn and I have an indoor arena and an outdoor arena, but I've got crappy parking. What do you suggest? And so we can come up with a clinic format that will work with what you have on your farm. And as Tara mentioned earlier, I, I do like to say this because running a horse business can be so stressful. You want to leverage your property. So you want to look around and figure out where, what parts of your property can be profit centers. So in addition to, you know, having a covered arena and you can teach lessons through all kinds of weather. What else can you do with your covered arena? What else can you do with your outdoor? Um, do you have bathroom up, uh, indoor plumbing? <laughs> you know, what is it about your property that might be agreeable or comfortable to guests who are coming to an event at your place? So as you look around your farm and you identify those profit centers, you can think about how a clinic can fit into your property versus how your property can serve to host clinics, if that makes any sense. So that's my dog and pony show. Elena, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, I know we've had some questions come in during that. Um, one of the things I heard from both you and Margaret as you were going through was really the need for um, customer service throughout the whole experience and understanding how much customer service really drives your revenue and your ability to create revenue. Um, and also understanding how the hospitality on the day of drives your revenue. Um, I, I heard that from both of you. I'm really understanding that if someone feels welcome when they're at your facility, they're more likely to come back. And one of the questions that prompted this webinar was, you know, how do I raise money by having a series? How do I raise money by having people come out every single week to my clinics um, that I'm hosting and really get $10,000, $15,000, $20,000 of additional income for either myself as a trainer or my venue by having these clinics over time? Um, and I heard that that hospitality theme, and I was thrilled to hear it from both of you, um, because I th think it really makes you hear antidotally so many times from people, oh, I went to this clinic and nobody said hello to me, or I went to this clinic and, and nobody said, oh, so happy to have you here, you know, here you go. Um, we're big fans of signage at Strider, like, you know, if you have a sign on the bathroom that says this is where your bathroom is, and this is where trailer parking is, and this is where the warm up is, and if you send out a map before the clinic, people really like that. Um, have you found that there's specific things that are more likely to create revenue, whether that's charging for lunch or charging for a day stall when you have your clinics? Um, when you, I saw your spreadsheet had a couple different options there. The, I, I, I haven't found, I, I don't do as many clinics as Margaret, but I haven't found that food makes a huge difference um, in value, but I have found that um, on, on-site stabling is, is a big one um, and you can charge extra for that, but that's a big one because people do want to not only bring their horse, but they also want to see the rest of the clinic and they want to know first and foremost, can I put my horse someplace comfortable and safe? So, you know, having on-site stabling is a big one, but signage too, you know, again, that process, people feel the friction. They might not be conscious, consciously aware of it, but they feel the friction. I don't know where to go. When you pull in, what do you do? How much time are you wasting? And again, you're leaving your horse on the trailer no matter how well behaved they may be, that's always a little bit stressful. I do signs for parking. I do signs for bathroom. I do signs for registration. I always have a table for registration and someone who is in a good mood there to welcome anyone who's coming in. Mm -hmm. The person's list, you know, the um, registration list is right there. So someone just pops right into that table. The list is ready for the person to check off. Do they have all their documentation? They sign their waivers. Yep, you're good to go. And then we give them a sticker. <laughs> Purple for riders, red for auditors. And they get to wear that sticker. And you know what? It's a silly little sticker, but they love them. They love them. It's something tangible that says, welcome here. I'm an auditor and they're proud or I'm a rider. And it also helps the rest of the team and or the community there on that day know who's who, you know, so if there's right. someone running around with their hair on fire and they're wearing a purple sticker, yeah, that's a rider. <laughs> yeah. 
So those are just a few of the things that I find add some extra value. Great. Great. Well, certainly, I think um, everyone is going to be very happy to receive the spreadsheets that you're both sending out. Um, for those of you who joined a little late, um, both Margaret and Helena are going to be offering complimentary consultations um, as a after this webinar. Um, so if you want to have a one on one with either one of them to talk about your particular business situation and what you can realistically expect with clinic revenue in your scenario, um, they're both great people to reach back out to. Um, I know we've got some questions that are coming in on the Q&A, so I'm going to turn it over to Natasha Springers Levine now, who's going to handle the Q&A. Um, feel free to chat your Q&As over to Natasha. Mm -hmm. Um, if you haven't yet already, um, there's a lot of good ideas coming in. Um, I've seen a few of them come in and someone direct to Natasha. So over to you, Natasha. Yeah, so um, I'll kick off with the most recent question and then kind of work backwards from there. Um, and uh, Kim asked about having a VIP dinner with the trainer, which is something that I've seen pop up a lot. I know that we've done on Strider a lot of ticket sales for it. So I'm I'm curious to hear the response from Margaret and Helena on this one. Have you guys found that having a VIP dinner with the trainer or VIP lunch or something of that nature helps to add value and boost your revenue? I'll I go. start with Margaret. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, I'll go first. Okay. So um, I'm really lucky that I live in the heart of area two. So we don't have to, there's not a lot of overnight stabling involved with a lot of the clinics that we're doing in our area. Um, so However, occasionally we will bring in some pretty big names from outside of our area. And then I do try to involve some sort of Q&A, um, lunch, dinner. I just caution you to make sure that you get that approved for, by the clinician before you start planning it. Because, you know, you want to take their day into consideration that sometimes they're on their feet on, if you will, for eight plus hours teaching. And so a lot of times they won't mind doing a VIP dinner, but you might need to like give them a break, you, you know, or only do it one night of a two night clinic. Um, but yeah, any time, any extra time that you can provide with the clinician, I think is always good. Yeah, I try to protect the clinicians from uh, being bombarded with yeah. unsanctioned questions or Q and A. Um, but it is very valuable, and I again, I find that what people really want is the clinician's undivided attention, or they want to pick their brains. And so, I think that having a VIP dinner is an excellent way to do that. Definitely clear it with the clinician first. And then again, it goes back to scheduling your day. What format do you want your clinic to look like? We don't want to stress the clinician out so that by the time dinner comes around, they have a little bit of energy to sit down, have a nice meal, and then answer some questions. So you, you do have to kind of be your, your clinician's handler as well as a clinic organizer. And so if you can keep them comfortable, then those VIP dinners uh, have a nice upcharge to them. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you both for that. So uh, my next question kind of goes back to a little bit of policy. And this was one you touched, both of you touched on this a little bit, but I'd like to hear from both of you as far as setting those policies, refunds, cancellations, et cetera. Can you both speak to a little bit of your experience with holding your ground on those policies? Ooh, ooh, me, me, me. Okay, <laughs> go, go ahead. Go for it. <laughs> I am such a stickler for process. Um, mm -hmm. I really like to stick to the process. So there's not a lot of flexibility in my policies. Um, and I'm very, very clear about communicating those policies from the very beginning. In, right in, in the marketing, I bake uh, in my policies into the marketing. Um, I'm flexible because things happen with horses, but only up to a point. And I try to make sure that if I am accommodating somebody who has an issue, that it doesn't take more than 20 minutes of my time to resolve. 
because I charge for my time. So, and it's not that people want to take advantage, but you kind of have to, especially when you're spending three, four or $500 for a clinic and your horses come up lame the day before. So if I was not rigid in my policies and my process, then I wouldn't be able to be flexible to those people who really need it. Right. And so if you're late, you're late. Sorry, you missed your slot. Um, if you can't make it, you can sell your spot to somebody else. Just yeah. you've got five days notice to do that. And if what you're, what you're changing is going to take more than 20 minutes, there's a change fee. And again, you've got to put this in big, bold, red letters, and you've got to communicate it every single time you send out an email or a note or whatever it is to, um, to your attendees. You just have to be clear about it. But it's you're running a business and lots of things happen with customers. And I love the buying a concert ticket analogy. Double that for horses, right? Lots more things happen because they're horses. You know, there's, there is a challenge is like, okay, I need to fill this clinic. Um, or let's say I'm the, I'm a wannabe attendee and I've got this horse and I know the clinic is coming up like two months from now. I don't know if my horse is going to be ready. I don't know if she's going to be sound. I don't know if I'm going to be ready. Am I willing to take the risk and sign up now and commit all that money without the guarantee that I'm actually going to be able to show up and ride and get something out of the clinic that day? So because that's a very real thing for us to consider, you do have to build in some flexibility to your scheduling, to your customer service. Yeah, okay. We can make a change. We'll take substitutions, but it's going to cost you a couple of bucks and you're going to need to give me plenty of lead time. Don't be substituting, you know, a 12 year old schoolmaster for a four year old off track thoroughbred. <laughs> right. So again, stick to the process so that you can be flexible where it counts. Yeah. Margaret, do you have some stuff? Some thoughts. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add is that I really encourage people to put together clinic series and the way that this relates to it is one, a clinic series is great even if you have someone come out quarterly or something because it gives a little bit of familiarity with that between the clinician and the people and that's one thing that I've found is that the reason why people like coming to the clinics that I do is because they do have the opportunity to get to know the clinician over, you know, a period of time. So where that comes with the policies and everything is one thing that I'll do is, you know, I have my closing date and say someone comes to me before the closing date and says, my horse has an abscess, you, you, you know, I mean, it happens. Could I, and they say, could I just move myself to the next date? And what my policy is, is like, yes, I'll do that. It's before the closing date. So there isn't a change fee involved. You know, like Helena was saying, that's not going to take me a lot of time because I have my spreadsheets with all of my dates at the bottom of them. And I am just moving that entry from clinic one to clinic two. But at that time, I tell them this is a one-time change. So now if you are locked in to clinic two. Um, and if you have to cancel or for whatever reason, you know, that there's no refund. And I let people know what these policies are upfront so that they know what to expect, that there's no surprises, that they can't say the, oh, well, I didn't know. You know, that that's my goal is that no one can, can come to me and say, oh, well, I didn't know that was your policy. Yeah. And I just want to ask, cause I think this is always like mind boggling, right? Like how many times are you guys telling people these policies? Cause I doubt I it's have, just I, one. I mean, <laughs> I put them every email communication that I send out about a clinic, whether it's a schedule, a, Hey, heads up, we just booked this date or whatever. I just put my clinic policies at the bottom of the emails because Again, with the volume that I'm doing, you know, you think every clinic has 12 to 20 people, and then you multiply that by 
too many this winter. You know, it's just a lot of people. So you you have to make your ground ground rules. Well, and Helena, you said you bake it into your marketing, but getting people to absorb that message and, you know, essentially behave the way you want them to behave takes <laughs> basic marketing practices of telling them over and over and over again. And so, you know, I think for a lot of clinic organizers that can feel a little bit daunting and feel a little bit like they're, you know, beating a dead horse to use a terrible analogy, but I don't think it is that, right? Um, and I think that's what both of you are saying is that like, stick to those policies, stick to those procedures and practices. Yeah. It is, and it is basic. It is marketing 101. You, you just have to keep putting the content in front of your audience because it takes them at least seven times for anything to actually register and to have a little empathy. Um, it's people don't try, they're not trying to be difficult. They're busy. And a lot of them are juggling way too many things. So just understanding that they're not being aloof or forgetful, or they're not paying attention on purpose. It's just they're not capable. And so you have to help them and you have to think about who your audience is. That's, that's when you're planning the clinic or whether you're communicating with your clinic attendees, you have to think, consider the people that you're serving. And when you do that, then you, the message actually gets through. You yeah. find that they hear you, right. Rather than just droning on and, and, um, you know, spouting out the same old, same old, when you consider your audience, somehow the message is, gets crafted in a way that goes in um, a lot faster and a lot deeper than, than otherwise. Yeah. yeah. And you could, you know, expand that to your um, business philosophies, you know, where we're talking about your, you want a qu quality clients, not just quantity of clients. And I, I think beyond clinics, a lot of horse people struggle with filling their stalls, if you will, but are you filling your stalls with the right type of client? You know, and so when you set up all of your policies and you're just very upfront about it of like, hey, this is who I am, this is what you're getting into, the the right type of people are gonna be attracted to that. That is such a great point to make. And I just had this conversation in episode 94 of the Stall and Stable <laughs> Show with Reese Koffler Stanfield. And we were talking about, she made a great quote. She said, you don't need a full barn to be successful. No. And it's about finding that sweet spot, the right number of horses in your barn so that you can give them your best, the right clients. And that's the same thing with clinics. It's about the experience. Absolutely. Um, so we had a couple of questions come in relating to sponsors. So I'm going to see if I can mold them into one question. <laughs> it's going to have like parts A, B, and C. So just get ready for that. Um, so do you find that pulling in sponsors to offset costs is beneficial? And does it help boost revenue in terms of having grab bags for riders or sponsor goodie bags? Um, and does that also help with cross promotion in both of your experiences? Yes. It's a big question. Um, and Helena, I see you nodding. So we'll start with you and then pivot to Margaret. <laughs> well, it's going to be a quick pivot because it's just, yes, period. End of sentence. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> in the interest of efficiency. Yes. Great. And, and I work with a lot of companies, you know, part of my business, you know, beyond the clinic organizing is I do a lot of, um, essentially rider agents, you, you know, um, with their sponsors and the sponsors love it too. You know, it's, I always talk about, you know, you need your, your small pond and your big pond with sponsors and a clinic is your small pond of getting products directly into the hands of actual people, you know, your social media and your websites, that's your big pond type stuff. Um, and also like the riders love it and it just helps with your customer service and, you know, having those goodie bags, having, you know, breakfast sponsored by whomever, of course, why not? Yeah, we could do a whole nother webinar on event specific sponsorship and, you know, cash versus product and all that stuff. Um, but I, 
I definitely see the value in that. Um, and I think, you know, the questions that came in were very much related to like, is that just another item on the to-do list at that point, or does it actually help and add value? I'm a big fan of, again, looking at your property as a profit center space along the rail for banners. Mm -hmm. That's that's space you can sell, you know, yeah. it's it, that's you've got built in billboards. And if you've got a PA system, you can talk about each one of those sponsors who it's because sometimes it becomes just background, you know, white noise. It's just another vinyl banner. But if you take a few minutes to talk about who your sponsors are, why their product is great, that's a little bit more exposure. And again, yes, it goes into putting um, it's quality, putting your product in somebody's hands and they're highly engaged. This is kind of like the podcasting business model. You don't, especially when you're, you're working with a niche market and clinic attendees are very much a niche market. These people are, they're there, they're paying attention, they're engaged, they're enthusiastic, and they're ready to hear what you have to say. And they're ready to hear your sponsor's message. So I, I think it's a fabulous opportunity. I love if that. You're looking, if you're looking for, I'll make this quick. If you're looking for ideas of how to get sponsors, look at your clinician, see who sponsors them. And I guarantee you that some of the sponsors for that clinician, if you approach them and are like, Hey, we're having, you know, like I said, Stephen Bradley out to my farm. Do you want to participate, you know, in some way? they'll almost be thankful that you asked them, you know, because it's a new, it's something different. Um, and again, like I said, it's that small pond of direct product into hand, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And they can do things like, you know, add their stuff on the registration table or mm -hmm. something and, and really interact with people if they're local enough to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's amazing. Um, well, in the interest of time, I'm going to pass it back over to Tara. Um, I think we kind of got all the audience questions wrapped in somehow. So um, <laughs> thank you guys so much for all of that awesome information. Elaine and Margaret, thank you both so much for joining us tonight and yeah. sharing with us your thoughts. I know you can both speak at great length, so very much appreciate um, answering a lot of the burning questions. A lot of our attendees tonight were watching on Facebook, um, so we're going to get some questions after this webinar as well. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, everyone who's registered for the webinar is going to get the um, package of supplemental materials and as well as the live webinar recording um, sent to them in the next couple of days. So you'll have the contact information for Helena, you'll have the contact information for Margaret, you'll have their um, complimentary resources for how you can set up your spreadsheets and create a positive revenue clinic, which is always a good thing. You know, making money is always a positive thing. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out to either one of them if you have additional questions. Uh, there are wealth of information on how to have a profitable clinic or a clinic series, um, and they're available to you. So um, for those of you who are looking to expand your skill set in that area, uh, take advantage of it. Thank you all for joining us so much tonight. We appreciate you coming. Um, we know it's late in the evening for those of you on the East Coast, and you're just getting out of the barn if you're on the West Coast. So um, good seeing you all, and we hope to see you in the next one. Thanks so much.